to just turn on the accumulated work in your uh, harmonic uh, flock when you're using colors. And then you can try different ideas, different collective variables, maybe even different force constants. And um, you can look at the work and compare them. If you are getting lower work values, that's probably a good sign. It means that you're doing better. Your collective variable is probably a better collective variable. As long as you get what you expect to get. So if the transition that you are interested in doesn't happen, it's not a good sign anymore. So you can have a zero force constant, which will give you a zero work, but it wouldn't actually result in a transition. So that's not what you want. So you want to have the lowest amount of work as long as the transition that you're interested in actually takes place. So you have these two criteria. The transition should happen, and the end state should be what you expect. The intermediates also should not be crazy states. Like you, shouldn't ex you should not have uh, weird things happening to your protein, like some helix com completely unwinds. That's not a good sign. Uh, if you are interested in just larger scale conformational changes of the uh, protein. There, there could be sometimes unwinding of a little helix involved in the process, but uh, that might make it a little more difficult to study. So we are focusing more on uh, conformational changes that do not require much secondary structural changes, because once you open that Pandora's box, it's just going to be a lot more difficult to deal with your conformational change when there are also secondary structural changes involved. So um, non-equilibrium work pro provides some way of judging whether you are doing better or worse in optimizing your pulling protocol. And once you have a reasonable pulling protocol that can generate a pathway which um, qualitatively agrees with what you expect from a transition for your particular system and also doesn't require over a thousand kcal per mole of work. So if you run a simulation, non-equilibrium simulation, and the non-equilibrium work is 1000 kcal per mole, it's not a good sign for your uh, future steps. It means once you are going to do, for instance, um, free energy calculations, uh, you're not going to get a lot of exchanges between your windows, for instance, or uh, your simulations are going to convert very slowly. It, they, they do actually have a correlation. There is a correlation between the amount of work that your non-equilibrium simulation requires for the transition to take place and the performance of your free energy calculations. And uh, this is uh, something that has been shown for examples. Uh, there is no mathematical proof for it, uh, although there has been some theoretical work on it. Um, um, uh, especially by um, uh, Gavin Brooks, who, who has done some uh, theoretical work on what the non-equilibrium work means uh, and how it's related to something uh, that he calls the thermodynamic length, uh, which basically, um, although it's a non-equilibrium quantity, but it is related to some thermodynamic quantities, we definitely know that it's related to free energy, but through an ensemble average, which is very difficult to calculate but it's also related to some other thermodynamic quantities. So, yeah. Did you see that was thermodynamic length? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you can look it up. There are some theoretical works that have been done, but they are not at a stage that uh, can be used yet for uh, probably rigorous um, calculation or rigorous optimization. So uh, that's one area that I'm interested in, but um, I, I don't have something useful for you yet to do this 
process for automatically. So what I can propose is just to do this in an empirical manner. Just try different ideas and compare the non-equilibrium work. And one important thing about this approach is you need to somewhat uh, make sure that your results are reproducible. So non-equilibrium work uh, has some a stochastic feature in it. So if you repeat the exact same simulation with the non-equilibrium pulling protocol, you will not get the exact same work. You will get a different work. And there is a variation in the amount of work. And you can only uh, compare different protocols and different pathways when reproducibly you see a different uh, behavior in the amount of work. And if you do see that, if you repeat your simulation a couple of times and always see that one protocol gives you higher work than the other, it's probably uh, something that you can uh, use to distinguish between those pathways qualitatively. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about these things within the context of an example. And this is the glycerol 3 phosphate transporter which uh, is basically another transporter of major characteristics family. So it looks very much like the uh, proton uh, coupled oligopeptide transporter that I showed before. Structurally, it looks almost identical to it. It's basically 12 helices, two six helix bundles, and undergoes rocker switch type movement for its transition and, and transports phosphates. So in physiological conditions, it uses the uh, gradient of the organic, inorganic phosphate, the green things here, um, which <coughs> basically um, bind from the cytoplasmic site and go to the um, periplasmic site. And what they do, they, they basically trigger this conformational change. So the protein uh, sits in the inward facing state. That's the resting state of the protein. Uh, and it doesn't undergo the transition on, unless the phosphate uh, goes and binds and triggers the conformational change. And at that point, the glycerol 3 phosphate, an organic phosphate, can come and bind to the protein, and that also will trigger the conformational change and will go to the other side. This way, the established gradient of the phosphate, uh, inorganic phosphate, will provide the energy for the uh, transport of the organic phosphate against its concentration gradient. So it's, it's a secondary transporter. It uses the established gradient of one substrate or more than one sometimes to move or to transport uh, the, a, another substrate against its concentration gradient. Um, so uh, we are going to do some studies on the structural changes and the coupling between the structural changes and binding of phosphate. So it's a chem uh, chemomechanical coupling study. And we focus on the inorganic phosphate. So this is a relatively simple second transporter in the sense that uh, the, um, the two substrates here, the inorganic phosphate and organic phosphates, kind of work independently. In this, it's only the thermodynamics and it's only the, the difference of the concentration on both sides that dictate this particular function of the protein. So basically what happens is this protein um, doesn't like to undergo conformational change unless some sort of a phosphate binds to it. So that way, rather than studying the whole physiological transport cycle, I simply just study the transport cycle involving the inorganic phosphate. So this is the thermodynamic cycle that I'm interested in. I have uh, an inward facing protein. Uh, I have the binding of the phosphate to the binding site. I have the transport of the uh, phosphate from uh, the lower part of the protein to the higher part of protein, which is coupled to the conformational transition of the uh, protein. And this is not something that we can understand uh, from the crystal structure itself. The crystal structure actually gives us this. And if you try to dock the phosphate, it will basically give you something like this. 
but then uh, it comes out of other simulations that the outward facing state uh, with the bound phosphate looks different than the one with the uh, inward facing state. So in other words, there are rearrangements of the side chains uh, in a way that moves the substrate up and the outward facing bound state of the protein uh, has a different binding conformation than the inward facing bound state of the protein. So these are not the sort of things that you can actually understand just based on the crystal structure or based on equilibrium simulations of the crystal structure. If you run equilibrium simulations of the inward facing state or the inward facing bound state, they're not gonna tell you anything about how these uh, amino acids are going to be rearranged such that the binding site looks different when the transition occurs. Why? Because you never see the larger scale conformational changes of this protein in uh, your equilibrium simulations. This is exactly the same thing that we talked about for the hot transporter, that uh, they come, the larger scale conformational changes, the functionally relevant conformational changes are slow, such that the equilibrium simulations would not tell you anything about them. Okay, and then finally, we have the unbinding of the uh, phosphate. So people just, yeah. Has anybody drawn very long simulations like Anton type simulations? This? For this particular protein? No, I, I don't think that anyone has run uh, any simulations to see the full transition of a transporter. Uh, uh, we, we have run uh, simulations on Anton uh, for uh, other types of transporters to see parts of this process, uh, but not all of it. So the whole thing is very, very slow, especially these two are very, very slow, where you have the global conformational change. So you may see, if you, if you run these simulations on Anton, you may see occlusion of the binding site, uh, or you may see fluctuations of the gate, but you won't see uh, one gate to close and the other gate to open. Like This is really uh, a very, very large free energy barrier for transporters, usually uh, 8 kcal per mole or higher. So this is not something that uh, you can actually observe uh, within a sub millisecond <coughs> simulations. Um, so schematically, based on some kinetic studies, people have suggested this uh, for, for these different states, that the um, transition between the inward facing bound and outward, outward facing bound has a barrier um, which is lower than the barrier between the apol uh, inward facing and outward facing transition. Going back here, it means that even this transition is possible, but the barrier is just so much higher uh, that makes it uh, irrelevant. So, uh, and we have actually calculated these two barriers uh, doing the, 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 the simulations that I'm going to talk about. <coughs> so we have basically focused on this part of this uh, process, and we'll see that we can reconstruct this and we quantify this. Okay, so the crystal structure basically is the inward facing apo. Uh, and first, we try to study the inward facing apo to outward facing apo transition. So, well, we know that this is a very, very slow process, but it's still a possible process. Uh, and when you are using non equilibrium simulations and free energy calculations, um, you can actually study this kind of processes. Although the free energy barrier might be very large, like say 18 kcal per mole, but it doesn't mean that you can't study it. So when you are using this kind of uh, approach, um, when a process, when a transition, when a, the, when a free energy barrier is 18 kcal per mole, it's not necessarily more difficult to study than when it's 8 kcal per mole. What makes things more difficult is when you have more um, couplings involved, more collective variables, more orthogonal degrees of freedom that are involved in the process and are uh, coupled to each other. For instance, in this case, it turns out that 
this process, which is <coughs> physiologically slower, uh, easier to uh, easier than this other uh, process to study. Because here, we have another important factor, that's the phosphate, and the phosphate binding and its interaction with the, uh, with the amino acids makes it more difficult to study for us, although for nature, it makes it easier for, for that process to happen. And that's why we studied that first, yeah. How do you know you got the correct outward facing uh, confirmation? How did you know when you were at the lowest energy point? Um, we'll get there, so uh, I'm gonna actually uh, just use the same um, ideas I talked about, about the stability and about the water profile and the non-equilibrium work and things like that to um, judge whether we have something reasonable or not. So we can't ever say we have the answer, but we can say whether it's at least reasonable within our understanding or not. Well, yeah. So when you do this type of studies, do you use phosphate or not? Uh, well, uh, since I'm going to study the whole process, <laughs> I am going to use phosphate. But the first step that I, I approached this problem didn't involve phosphate. But later on, I eh, included that as well. We use the change. Right. So if you want to study this whole process, of course, you do need to have phosphate. If you want to just do the... Uh, this part of the cycle, which is the uh, irrelevant part of it, because uh, physiologically what we are interested in is this, the transition mediated by the phosphate. Yeah. The other one is a very, very slow process that we basically have put there just for a point of reference. For instance, if, if you do the calculations and you end up getting a lower barrier for this, then that, you know you've done it wrong. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, you you need to have uh, controls. So this is basically some sort of a control uh, for for the the whole computational experiment that we are doing here. So if I don't get a larger barrier for this transition, I know that I haven't done it right. Okay, just sorry, maybe I should rephrase because you're pulling this on equilibrium then. Can also not use the phosphate. You're using the phosphate just as a baseline. Right, but what we will actually observe at the end is the pathways taken by the transporter is not the same in the two cases. So when there is no phosphate, it takes a different conformational transition pathway. And when the phosphate is present, it takes a different <laughs> Confirmation pathway. And that is one of the findings of this. Oh, study. The same methodology. Exactly. So basically, uh, one of the uh, observations that we made, which makes this kind of uh, studies relevant, because if you just want to uh, basically provide uh, people with the same ideas that experimentalists have already uh, have, that wouldn't be useful. Uh, when, when you do these studies and reconstruct the entire pathway, for instance, that allows you to observe things that otherwise are not known. Like in this case, um, without these simulations, there is no particular reason that we know the pathway is different for the two uh, transitions here. And it actually suggests something very interesting about the transporters, it, about the secondary transporters, for instance. It says that the uh, the substrate itself is involved in the uh, conformational transition of the transporter. And this is, this is not something necessarily known or uh, proven that we observe in this particular case. Okay, so um, this is basically an example that I want to show. And this is, by the way, the same example put in the tutorial. So you are going to be working with the same protein if you do the tutorial. So I basically tried uh, many different ideas for um, imposing this conformational change. I had only one crystal structure. And the good thing about this approach is, uh, unlike some of the other approaches, like, for instance, TMD, uh, you don't necessarily have to have a second state for the simulations. You need to have ideas about the other state. Um, so the first idea was using RMSD or basically TMD based on a homology model of 
this protein using the outward facing state of another transporter, which was homologous to it. So uh, that gave us a very large amount of work that I haven't even plotted part of it because uh, I, I have more useful things to put in my plot. So it basically goes to, you know, I don't know, 500 kcal per mole or something like that. Uh, then we um, thought that maybe we should just rotate these 12 different helices of the protein. And for that, we used uh, the internal symmetry idea um, that is uh, basically uh, something that uh, Lucy Forrest has been promoting, which uh, gives you some ideas about how you can model uh, an outward facing state from an inward facing state or an inward facing state from an outward facing state. So it's a modeling idea that we used. Um, and then based on that modeling idea, we figured out what uh, orientational changes we need to impose. That also kind of worked and it gave us a lower amount of work. So that turned out to be better than using a homology model and an RMSD, collective variable. So we used 12 orientation uh, collective variables. Then uh, we thought about simpler ideas. Uh, what about just rotating the two bundles? Uh, I have two bundles, each composed of six helices. I can just rotate them. So um, because of the rocker switch mechanism idea. So this one uses the rocker switch mechanism idea, and that's the one that you uh, you, you'll see in the tutorial if you do the tutorial. Uh, the next one uses only four very important helices that we see have the largest amount of orientational change. So if you look at your simulations, your previous simulations, and you monitor the uh, orientation of different helices and how much uh, rotational changes, changes they have, you realize that these four helices have the highest uh, rotational changes. So what if we just use those four helices? So we kind of are going towards a more minimalistic uh, approach for imposing this because you don't want to make this too complicated, especially if you are going to do uh, non-equilibrium pulling. For instance, one of the issues we had here for using all 12 helices was how do you uh, combine them? Like, uh, do you change all of these linearly? Like, um, is the timing the same for all 12? Maybe not. And if it's not, then it will result in a less optimum pathway and results in a higher amount of work. So you see that the ideas, uh, different ideas give different amount of work. And of course, there have been ideas that we have tried. We tried 100 different simulations. Uh, and uh, some of them gave higher amounts of work. So basically, uh, using different ideas could give you a uh, higher or lower amount of work. And you do this until you reach to a point which uh, uh, is uh, requiring the least amount of work while still uh, having the transition taking place. So in this case, the last idea that we tried was rotating only two helices. Helix 1 and Helix 7. And it seemed to be working. So we actually could get the transition happening. And I will tell you why uh, I, th I think the transition is happening. But uh, we got the transition happening, the same kind of transition, by only rotating two helices. And it required the least amount of work, only 40 kcal per mole. And you can imagine that you could use any of these <laughs> collective variables to do free energy calculations or string method uh, path finding algorithms. But the better pathway you use, the closer pathway you use to the correct pathway, you have a higher chance of converging faster and doing the job basically with a um, smaller amount of computational cost. So these things are not very computationally expensive. They are more uh, basically uh, labor intensive. 
So you, you need to just spend more time. Now, we didn't actually start with 20 nanoseconds. Uh, initially, we were even using like shorter simulations. So this is more for um, maybe my presentation that I'm showing the 20 nanoseconds one. But sometimes you can actually distinguish between different collective variables even with shorter simulations. If you are just kind of, uh, you want to try to use a high throughput screening for your collective variables, you can even start with five nanosecond simulations to distinguish uh, between different collective variables. Some of them could be bad uh, very uh, clearly, and you don't have to spend too much time on them. Yeah. Practical question. So when you pull on this thing, the sub membrane, yes? Mm -hmm. What happens to the particular molecules? Um, well, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the lipid molecules just move. So in this case, well, the, it's not a very large change to the membrane in this case. And the membrane is large enough. So we usually, if, if we want to have uh, this kind of simulations, you need to use a membrane patch, which is larger than what you would usually use in a regular equilibrium simulation. Because when you are making this kind of conformational changes, you don't want to distort your uh, membrane too much. Yeah, but the best idea to use would be, especially if you want to do uh, free energy calculations, would be uh, to use a particular uh, a type of boundary conditions for membranes. I don't think it's still implemented in AMD, the P21. Uh, yeah, so that's that would be the way to go because it, it basically allows for the lipids to exchange between the two, um, between the oh, two okay. uh, lipids. Uh, otherwise, there will be some inaccuracies in the results eventually because, uh, yeah. So in this case, we counted the number of lipids in both sides of the membrane. They're, they're almost equal, both in the inward facing and in the outward facing model that we independently generated. So in this case, that wasn't an issue, but in many cases, it could be an issue. Okay, so this was the optimum uh, protocol, and why I think that it does, uh, it does um, um, represent the outward facing state, because if you look at the water profile, uh, you start with the inward facing state, which is the red one here, so you have a closed, this is the number of water molecules basically along the Z. So you see that not, not many water is here, and then a lot of water is here in the, in, uh, in the cytoplasmic site. And then during the transition, you never have actually a lot of water molecules on both sides, which, which is a good sign. It means that it, it, it does not contradict the alternate gases mechanism. Uh, if you end up with an open channel that like you have water is all over, that's not a good sign because alternate, alternating access mechanism uh, is against that kind of conformation. Um, and then the outward facing state does look like an outward facing state. You have more water molecules on the outside, on the uh, periplasmic side, and then um, the, here uh, you don't see many water molecules. And then if you equilibrate the final state, it will stay open and it will still have this water profile. So this is how we can validate that at least our pathway makes some sense. So you may end up, if you use a collective variable that's not appropriate, you may end up with a bad pathway. Uh, either it does not generate your uh, end state that you're looking for, or uh, it may actually have an intermediate, which doesn't make sense. Like you may have some of the uh, secondary structure of the protein distorted, for instance. Uh, you, might have, you, might, you might have weird things happening. So you need to always make sure that the pathway <coughs> that is generated is uh, making sense. So sometimes you have to run a longer non-equilibrium simulation to be able to achieve that. Sometimes uh, 20 nanoseconds may not be enough, but it might be too fast and it may result in the distortion of the protein. So uh, that is something, again, um, to be determined empirically. So you just have to uh, usually try with uh, smaller, uh, like shorter simulation times because you don't want to spend too much computer time. And then you can go uh, higher and higher. You make them longer and longer to a point that 
especially for more promising protocols, uh, long enough uh, such that uh, there are less artifacts in your simulation, especially if this is going to be used for free energy calculations, you don't want to start with distorted proteins. And this is definitely needs to be checked. So just following the steps blindly doesn't help. You need to always make sure that everything looks good. And you can do this qualitatively by just visualizing the, the trajectories. And you can do this quantitatively as well by PCA analysis, by looking at certain uh, secondary structural, um, basically monitoring secondary structure of the protein, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm asking about the question, but mm -hmm. so you cannot say the pathway that gives you the lowest free energy is this is not the lowest case. work. Yeah. In but this case, lowest work. We haven't got to the free energy okay. yet. Lowest work is not the good one. We need to also consider other things. Uh, yeah. So the pathway that you get uh, and requires uh, it's it's better than the other pathways that you have got out of the other protocols, but it doesn't mean that it's good. So you can always compare, the, you know, it gives, it's, it's a comparative uh, uh, study of different pathways that you can generate, but it doesn't mean that any of them is eventually the correct one. Uh, the, the, I mean, the one to choose to continue. Yeah, I mean, if, if you don't get something, if you don't get a pathway that makes sense, you have to just try harder. Just the use other collective variables, so use I other think ideas. Like four or five cents, would you choose the one with, with the, the lowest work? amount of work? As long as in other aspects they are similar. So if they, if they all generate the end state, if they all have intermediate states that are not distorted, <coughs> then I will uh, choose the one with the lowest amount of work, because that would be more promising. Um, there is another example here that I'm going to uh, talk about because it uh, kind of uh, uh, tells you how you can combine different collective variables uh, and make statements about the transmission neuron without running any free energy calculations. Uh, so non-equilibrium work, and th this is not something that you, you, you have to do. This is not a necessary step of this uh, procedure. This is just an example that I did uh, a while back it's like five years ago, um, that <coughs> basically I simply just use non-equilibrium simulations to make uh, uh, statements about uh, different possible pathways. And you'll see that how it works. So this is without free energy calculations, just comparative, uh, just a qualitative comparison of different pathways. So uh, here we have uh, uh, another membrane transporter with three crystal structures. A higher resolution one, which is outward facing, uh, and two, uh, and, uh, and a very low resolution, which is um, basically uh, inward facing, and another uh, lower resolution structure, which is inward facing as well, but it's less open. So this is the same, these are the same things, just rotated uh, to, to see both sides. <coughs> so and these are closed on the uh, periplasmic side and open on the cytoplasmic side, although one is more open than the other. And this is closed on the cytoplasmic side and open on the periplasmic side. So if you run an equilibrium simulation for this protein, uh, at that time we ran for 300 nanoseconds. Uh, we basically, uh, so this is, this is actually something that uh, Jerome was uh, mentioning. You can, if you have multiple collective, uh, multiple, uh, crystal structures, you can actually see the values associated with them in different collective variable spaces. In this case, I have three crystal structures, outward facing, inward facing open, and inward facing closed. And if I look at uh, like three different collective variables, alpha uh, is basically the collective variable that um, describes the, um, um, the angle between these two bundles. Beta is one that describes the um, angle between these two bundles, and gamma is the one that describes the angle between these two uh, nucleotide binding domains, and then there is also a distance that uh, I use in my calculation. But if you look at uh, these three structures in the alpha-beta space, the opening in the uh, periplasmic and cytoplasmic side, you see that they are actually spread in different parts. 
Uh, if you start with an outward facing state, which is the higher resolution crystal structure, and run 300 nanoseconds, you basically don't see any transition happening towards the other states. And this is exactly what I was talking about uh, in the beginning of my uh, morning session, that uh, if you run an equilibrium simulation, it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the <coughs> state transition. Uh, so, uh, this was 300 nanoseconds. Uh, recently, uh, using Anton, we ran, we ran three 2.4 microsecond simulations, three independent sets of 2.4 microsecond simulations of this system in the same environment. Uh, it wasn't the exact same system. It was a homologue of this protein uh, called SAV1866 in the in, uh, uh, outward facing state. So it's basically uh, just a very, very similar protein. And we didn't see uh, any of these transitions happening. And it basically behaved the same way even after uh, 2.4 uh, microseconds, repeated three times. So you shouldn't expect equilibrium simulations to work for uh, some of these systems because just uh, they are associated with uh, very, very large time scales. So what we tried to do was we tried to use these different collective variables to push the system in different orders. And this, this was coming from some ideas, again, that people had suggested based on some experimental data and so on. Um, so there are four different collective variables. So going back here, um, there is the beta, there is alpha. So beta, by the way, itself is two different collective variables. I'm just simplifying it here. It's basically the orientations of these two uh, uh, bundles that I use as my collective variables. Beta just gives you kind of the, uh, the, the angle between them for uh, simplifying my presentations, uh, reducing the dimensionality. But what I used in the simulations for pulling was the orientations of these two bundles of helices. Um, so beta, alpha, gamma, which is the nucleotide binding domains, and the distance between the nucleotide binding domains, which is different here and here. So the distance between these two domains is also another collective variable you can use. So you can actually try different ideas to go from the inward facing to the outward, uh, in this case, the outward facing to the inward facing. And you see different trials using these collective variables in different orders. And uh, you see that uh, eventually, you end up with one which has less than 100 kcal per mole a non equilibrium work, while the other ones are all <coughs> higher. So, this would be um, the more uh, promising pathway to start your free energy calculation if you want to. But what is interesting, even if you don't want to do free energy calculations for that at, at this point, is if you look at the order that we are pulling these different collective variables, it can tell you something about the mechanism, if it's reproducible. So one thing which is interesting is all of these protocols that uh, involve pulling an alpha before beta. Alpha was the uh, periplasmic opening, and beta was the cytoplasmic opening. Uh, sorry, the alpha was the cytoplasmic opening, and beta was the periplasmic opening. So if you open the uh, cytoplasmic site before the periplasmic site, uh, before you close the periplasmic site. Um, this requires a lot of work. So this is directly related to the alternating access mechanism. So the alternating access mechanism tells you that you need to close this before you open this. This is basically the literal meaning of the alternating access mechanism. You cannot open this before you have closed this. Otherwise, you will have both sides accessible to uh, the substrate. So what we, we are seeing here is actually the direct result of the alternating access mechanism that whenever that we try to pull alpha before beta, we, we try to open the periplasmic site, uh, sorry, the cytoplasmic site before closing this periplasmic site, we need a lot of work. 
And it doesn't matter whether you, you involve gamma, which is the NBD distance and NBD angle, whether you involve the distance between the NBDs, no matter what you do, if you do alpha before beta, it requires more work. And if you try to repeat these, some of these orders change. But what doesn't change is we always get alpha. Uh, if, if alpha is before beta, you're going to have more work. This is something that is reproducible. So I wouldn't actually uh, try to compare these different protocols, because if, if I repeat them, I see uh, sometimes um, this going over this one and sometimes this going over that one. So I wouldn't actually uh, uh, say that, that they are uh, statistically different, at least with this resolution of work that I have. But one thing that is reproducible is that whenever I do alpha before beta, I need a lot of work. Now, if I do beta before alpha, I need less work. However, another variable uh, comes into equations here, and that is gamma, which is the relative orientation of the two NBDs. I actually find out that if I don't, um, I don't change the orientation of the NBDs, um, I, uh, I wouldn't be able to do uh, the, the transition uh, in a reasonable way. So whenever that I do beta and gamma in whatever order before alpha, so it means that I close the side, the, the periplasmic side, I rotate the NBDs, then it makes it easy to open the cytoplasmic side. So uh, this is only meaningful, of course, if you repeat this in your results, some of it might be reproducible, some of it may not be reproducible. So there is a resolution for this kind of uh, comparisons that you need to consider. And I have one particular protocol, which is an interesting one. It, has, uh, it is associated with the lowest amount of work. It's not necessarily the best protocol because we haven't tried necessarily everything. Like, for instance, we haven't tried <coughs> some of these things happening in parallel. We have made an assumption that let's do these things in a, in a sequential manner. So this is an assumption that we made to simplify or to limit the, combi uh, the, the different combinations. So it doesn't necessarily represent the, uh, the correct pathway, but it represents a closer pathway to the free energy, minimum, minimum free energy path, probably. It's a more promising pathway to start free energy calculations <laughs> with. And it involves the... Um, a, a few different steps that I, I'm going to show you in uh, this movie. So it involves some opening of these first, and then the closing of the periplasmic site, and then the twisting of the NBDs, and finally the opening of the cytoplasmic site. So Collective variables, uh, working with collective variables, having ideas about collective variables, trying to implement them, trying to use them, uh, allow, uh, really allow you to, uh, to, to come up with uh, interesting pathways. And this is only one pathway out of uh, many that we generated, but it's the most promising one. Yeah. How can you be sure? I mean, mm -hmm. I always already published. But how can you be sure of the causality relationship between the motion and the timeline of this motion? They're like a, we have like a safeguard to say, well, this is the correct chronology. Uh, not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm actually not sure that they should be in a sequential manner. They probably happen in a more uh, collective manner, at least some of them. However, if, I, if you ask me among these different pathways and different ways of doing this, which one is probably better, which one is closer to what happens when you have the holy grail, which is the minimum free energy path, I would say this is probably better. Because reproducibly, when I repeat this, I see that this is going doing better than the rest of them. Um, and uh, this is, this is the, the reason that, uh, that I have for this being a more promising pathway to start now more systematic uh, transition path optimizations, like with the <coughs> method, uh, 
and free energy contributions. Yeah. Are you able to make any conclusions about the IF to the OF confirmation change because you don't have events like drug binding or ATP binding associated with this? Or are you just assuming that it's the reverse process? Uh, well, uh, the, this process that we are, uh, we are looking at here is a physiologically relevant process because uh, we are looking at what happens after, uh, in this particular case, you have an ABC transporter, which uh, basically uh, is in the outward facing state when the ATPs are bound. Okay. Now, at some point, ATPs hydrolyze and ADPs leave, and then there is a downhill uh, conformational change happening that it goes back to this resting state. So the resting state for this uh, protein would be the inward facing open state, not necessarily this, this much open, it may be less open than that, but that's the, um, the resting state for the apoprotein. So here, if the ATP is, so ATP is where the crystal structure, we remove them. So if the ATPs are hydrolyzed, uh, then we expect this process to happen. So this is a physiologically relevant process here. And uh, so it, uh, we, we don't need to have the drug or the ATPs to study it. The only caveat is some people suggest the ATP hydrolysis itself uh, is relevant, uh, which is probably true. But uh, even without the ATP hydrolysis, if the ATPs aren't there, we know from the experiments that this is the right resting state. So if you don't have ATPs in the system, thermodynamically, this is the favored state. Therefore, uh, we are looking at a downhill, basically, uh, thermodynamic process here. OK, so, um, so I have a couple of slides here about orientation quaternions. And the reason I have these slides here is just because uh, if you want to do the tutorial, you may want to know just a couple of little things about it. Uh, I don't go through everything in detail, but I'll, I'll just put the uh, equations here for you to look at. You can also find them in uh, different papers. So the orientation quaternions are very old concepts in mathematics. Uh, and even uh, the applications of them is uh, well known in different fields, like in computer animation, I know that they are being used. So um, um, I, uh, I think that um, the, the Kendall paper that uh, Jerome mentioned was probably the, the one that introduced them to uh, protein modeling in the sense that the RMSD can use that where the, the fitting in the RMSD and then uh, I believe probably uh, your, your, your paper is probably the first paper that uses them as collective variables, correct? Yeah. So, um, so it's implemented by Jerome and uh, his colleagues, and uh, it's available in NAMI. And it's a very, very powerful collective variable that I almost use in all my work since 2011. And uh, because it's a very um, good way of describing larger scale conformational changes in proteins. So distance is something that can be used, but uh, is not, I believe, as relevant as the orientation. Usually what happens in, in the examples that I showed so far, you see that there is some sort of a rotational change, orientational change in different domains of the protein especially for membrane proteins when there is restriction on the movement of different parts. Uh, it's in, in alpha helical transmembrane proteins, you can think of orientation uh, quaternion or orientation collective variable to be the most relevant collective variable that you can use to impose the conformational changes that you are <coughs> interested in. So if you are interested in larger scale conformation, changes of proteins, especially membrane proteins, you better learn about this collective variable. It's going to make your life a lot more easier. And uh, also, your results are going to be a lot more interesting. And uh, therefore, I have a couple of equations here. So the quaternion is basically just an object, a mathematical, mathematical object with four elements. A unit quaternion 
uh, is a special kind of quaternion that has a unit. Uh, it's basically just like a unit vector where the sum of the uh, square of individual elements is equal to one. So it's a unit quaternion. An orientation quaternion is a unit quaternion uh, that is used for basically uh, finding the best rigid body rotation between two sets of coordinates. So when you have two sets of coordinates and you want to align them, uh, there are two elements to this alignment. One is the translational one, which is easily uh, found by just calculating the distance between uh, or the vector between the central masses. So it can easily align two sets of uh, atoms on top of each other translationally by just measuring the center of uh, basically uh, determining the center of mass of each one and then aligning them uh, or the geometric distance if that's what you want. Um, the next would be the rotational alignment, finding the best rotation that fits them on top of each other. And uh, orientation quaternion is one method for doing that, is a rigorous mathematical method to do that. So if, if one set is the uh, n different atoms, each one has a position of xk, uh, you want to rotate xk to align it with yk. Um, you want to find a quaternion that in uh, this formula uh, gives you the minimum value uh, for the difference of the rotated coordinates uh, minus the reference coordinates. Uh, and you want to minimize basically the sum of the square value of those. Uh, or the ensemble average or the average of them. So basically all oops. <clears throat> what happened there? It's freaking out? Yeah, I think too much <laughs> equations for this. <laughs> <laughs> too much oh, mass for a Friday morning. Questions so far? Uh, yeah, I have yeah. one question. So, if you don't have like a second state, like mm -hmm. you were saying that you can you can still do. Uh, yeah. So, how do you know like when do you convert? So, uh, well, the, the examples I showed, one of the examples I showed was exactly that. So I only had one crystal structure. Uh, I, I used some ideas for the second structure, like homology models or some other ideas. But then uh, once you do the transition, basically you do the pulling, and you end up with a state, you can always equilibrate it and see whether it goes back or it finds some, some minimum to do. It may not always work. Uh, a lot of times, actually, if you're not using the right collective variables uh, or uh, you're not using the right end idea, it may actually go back to where it started from or it may end up with some intermediate. And uh, even if it's a stable, it doesn't really mean that it's the end of state. You know, it could be some intermediate that is uh, locally stable. So this is uh, just a difficult problem. and. Uh, that's why we always need to double check everything. And uh, it's mainly about um, making sure that we move to the next stage. Uh, we have examined everything that we can about the relevance of our system. And then once we go to the next step, we may still find out at the end that something went wrong. And I will have a comment about that. And I have actually a uh, scripts which is useful for recovering your data and using them for uh, better iterations of, of your system uh, or of your sample. So anyway, so just a very brief uh, comment about the quaternion. So eventually the quaternion that comes out of these uh, the, this magic calculations is can be written in this form. The cosine of theta half is the first element and the next three elements will be sine of theta half multiplied by a unit vector. What is that unit vector? That's the 
axis of rotation, the optimum axis of rotation, and what is theta, that's the optimum angle of rotation. So that's just the relationship that uh, allows you to, to determine what the optimum axis and angle of rotations are after optimizing uh, Q to give this. And this is all done in the code, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the, the only thing that you need to know is that the orientation quaternion uh, that is uh, basically uh, provided to you means this. First element is related to the, uh, uh, the, the angle, the optimum angle uh, of rotation, and the next three elements are related to both theta and u. And then the uh, idea that was used in the work by uh, uh, Jerome and others uh, on, on his colleagues basically was using um, this relation as the biasing potential when you are doing uh, uh, restraining, when you are when, uh, basically as a harmonic potential, you can use half K distance squared like any other uh, harmonic potential except for the distance here uh, is the geodesic distance between the two quaternions. And uh, that is approximated by the dot product of the two quaternions. So it's an approximation for the geodesic distance of two quaternions. And that's a nice thing about it because it has this approximation. And uh, what are the two quaternions here? One would be the orientation quaternion of your current system based on some reference. So when you are using quaternions and quaternion related collective variables, you should always have a reference similar to RMSD calculations that always is defined based on a reference. Then that's one of the things that you determine. It could be your initial confirmation. It could be your final confirmation. It could be anything that you want, but usually one of the two uh, is, uh, is a good option. And this uh, tells you basically how uh, much your uh, current conformation is deviated from the reference conformation. So if you're in the middle of the transition, for instance, how much that is deviated from the original conformation, in what directions, all of that is in the quaternion embedded. And then this Q here, the other quaternion here is your uh, current center of the harmonic potential that you're using. So you're basically trying to restrain your harmonic potential at that particular time, or if you are doing umbrella sampling uh, in general, to be close to a particular quaternion, which could be somewhere halfway uh, through in your transition, or when you are getting closer to your uh, to your to, to the end state, it would be uh, the quaternion associated with the end state. So there are examples of, of these things. Um, both when your reference structure is the first uh, confirmation and your, when your reference structure is your last confirmation or your target confirmation. I have examples of both in the tutorial that uh, allows you to kind of get an understanding of what these things mean. Uh, there are uh, easier collective variables related to quaternion, like spin angle and tilt angle and, uh, and so on that allow you, uh, they, they allow you to uh, kind of uh, get around learning all the math. So you can use those whenever uh, appropriate to do uh, what you want in a much easier way. Um, Quaternion uh, also has uh, some advantages sometimes, uh, which uh, is, good, uh, is, is a good idea if, 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 if you are very serious about the simulations that you're doing. Uh, maybe after you learn how to work with spin angle and tilt angle and things like that, at some point to start working with the actual quaternions as well, or, or orientation collective variable itself, which is that four dimensional object, because there are some advantages in using that, because it, it basically has all the information that you need in it. Um, and it's a very, very well behaved mathematical uh, object. Uh, I have a couple of more slides for people who are interested on how the interpolation is done um, and how the um, work is calculated, for instance. The work, the non-equilibrium work, generally is calculated based on the time derivative 
uh, the partial time derivative of the bias and potential integrated over time. This is the definition of how it would work. And for quaternions, the analytical formula for the, uh, the top partial derivative of the non equivalent work with this particular uh, interpolation uh, is also given here, uh, just as a reference for people who are interested in the uh, theoretical uh, framework of this. Um, Okay, so finally, uh, I'm going to talk in the last five minutes about combining free energy calculations and pathfinding algorithms. So I'm going to skip uh, some information about transition pathways uh, and, uh, sorry, the, the pathfinding algorithms and free energy calculation methods. Uh, you know these things uh, from the previous uh, talks, hopefully. I'm also going to skip um, the Rebating schemes. So the uh, uh, I, I have the slides here, and, and you can uh, look at them. But uh, I'm not going to talk about them. That how uh, rebating is done and why using uh, basically non-parametric. So this is the conventional VAM, which is basically a parametric rebating scheme involving the uh, uh, histogram, uh, histograms and binning. So uh, you, some of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, the non-parametric uh, rebating is basically uh, assuming that every uh, conformation that is, that is sampled itself is a state. And you don't have to bend anymore because every single conformation that is sampled is basically a state. It's, you can assume that it, it has a bin of its own. In that case, uh, you can easily do non uh, parametric rebating, which is exactly like VAM then. So this is a scheme which was uh, proposed in year 2000 by uh, Bartels uh, is exactly the same as uh, weight, uh, the, the, the conventional VAM, except for if you look at the con conventional VAM, it involves a counting of the states in a bin or conformations in a bin. That is uh, just simply one, because every state has its own bin. And you just simply <laughs> use the conventional VAM, but define every state as a bin. And he came up with these two relations that you can solve iteratively. Uh, and I have a code for it, which is in the tutorial and uses this scheme, which is a very simple scheme to find uh, uh, free energies for you. Um, so uh, Michael Schertz and others, uh, Codera, Michael Schertz and uh, John Codera, they actually put these two relations of uh, Bartos together and basically it's one step. They came up with an, uh, basically a, a transcendental equation, which you can solve for, uh, in this case, Z, uh, which is e to the minus beta F. So you can solve for F or Z. Uh, and uh, basically um, that gives you the free energy as well. So it's the same idea as Bartos basically. And it's uh, non rebating uh, sorry, non-parametric rebating of your data. Um, so the one that I have implemented and is, uh, has a code that is used in the tutorial is actually uh, based on the Bartels idea, where you solve these two equations iteratively. Uh, you can also solve this equation uh, iteratively as well for f. Uh, the good thing about it, you can also do, do this afterward, after you find F, you can find the weight for every single conformation uh, using the Schertz and Codero M bar. Uh, in this approach, it gives you both simultaneously. So at the end of the, uh, when, when it's converged, it gives you the F, which is the free energy, and the weight for every single conformation. And you can use those weights for uh, measuring any ensemble averages. You can measure them to build potential of mean force in any arbitrary collective variable space. Not necessarily it's going to be accurate, but uh, you can do it. And uh, if, if it's not your collective variable used for sampling or not related to the collective variable used sampling, there is no guarantee that uh, it's sampled correctly. Uh, but uh, you can think of it as a blurry picture. If you, if you deviate from your, your collective variable space, it becomes blurry, blurry, and it fades away. Uh, but it's, it's doable. With, with these weights that you get, and the code gives you all those weights for every single confirmation that you have sampled, you can do any ensemble averages and 
uh, find out, for instance, what's the average value of that particular dihedral angle along my pathway. Um, so you can also do it without these weights, just using the, uh, the flat uh, weights for all of them, which uh, for certain uh, variables can be approximately correct. Anyway, so for this particular case, uh, we eventually used uh, multiple uh, BIOS exchange, uh, sorry, multiple string method with terms of trajectories uh, and uh, uh, multiple BIOS exchange free energy, uh, BIOS exchange umbrella sampling simulations to study this wing, this side of the cycle, this side of the cycle. So once you have the outer facing, you can um, study the binding, which is related to what uh, Shippo was talking about yesterday. And uh, then you can also study the binding to the inward facing state. Once you have these two states, you can also study the conformational changes between the two. And you can put all of it together. And you can actually run, and this is what we did at the end. We ran one single BIOS exchange umbrella sampling. First, actually, one single string method with storms of trajectories. Uh, simulation and after that a single bias exchange or row sampling simulating the entire cycle. So that would be basically a closed curve in a high dimensional space of collective variables and the collective variables here would be the orientation of all these 12 helices. So three independent degrees of freedom for each 36 and also the uh, position, the Z position of the substrate. So that would be 37 basically degrees of freedom in the collective variable space. And we, uh, we defined um, 150 points in this space and made a closed curve. Uh, remember, this didn't come out of just our imagination. It came out of individual simulations ran and combined. And eventually we ran a single simulation to get the free energies. And the free energies looked like what we were expecting, uh, except for, I mean, uh, the, this was real quantification rather than a schematic. So uh, if you remember, the schematic looked like this. Uh, and our simulations gave us something like this. So without the substrate, the barrier is larger. With the substrate, the barrier, barrier is low, lower. There are also features involved with the binding and unbinding and so on. Uh, you can also project this into different spaces. Uh, this is some abstract space of quaternion principal component, just to uh, mm -hmm. make things because you have 12 different helices and 12 different quaternions. So, uh, that's difficult to, to understand. So again, you can actually use principal components of, of them. Uh, and that would uh, give you some reduced dimension that you can visualize. So this is the two dimensional uh, space of the quaternion principal components can do this with dihedral angles to dihedral principal components. You can do principal component idea with different quantities. And you will end up with a pathway, which is again a closed pathway. And the interesting thing about it is if you look at the second quaternion principal component, it tells you that the apole transition is different from the substrate bound transition. So you have two completely different pathways for your transition when the substrate is there and the, 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 the substrate is not there, which is related to the question asked. Um, okay, so finally, one, one more thing that I want to uh, mention here is something called post hoc string method uh, that is also implemented. It's not in the, um, it's not in the, in the tutorial, but I can share the code with you if you want. And what it does is since you have multiple simulations that you run, uh, sometimes, and sometimes they fail, sometimes they, uh, they don't fail, but you want to combine them, like in this case, we had four different sets of simulations, we want to combine them. Um, this particular code, post hoc string method, is basically an analysis tool, which takes into account all the samples that you have generated somehow, and in a particular collective variable space that you define, you can put anything in there. You can put the principal components, you can put the, uh, the orientations, you can put certain dihedral angle 
uh, side uh, like side, dihedral angles of side chains or a backbone or anything that you are interested in, you can put in there and it will try to generate a, a pathway uh, of between the two states that you're interested in that uh, is as continuous as possible. So when you go from one state to the next state, uh, different quantities that you have defined with the, with the um, priority that you have given are as continuous as possible, uh, as similar as possible. And it goes through the pathway. So it's basically a method for combining your data to initiate uh, new simulations. It could be a string method simulation itself. You can basically use that to put your data together and then initiate a string method with storms of trajectories. Or you can use for free energy calculation. So this is basically a method which uses the string method idea, by the way. So it's doing, it's finding the principal curve. This is one of the string method ideas, not the string method of storms of trajectories. It basically just looks at all the samples, uh, use Voronoi tessellation, and then tries to find uh, certain uh, points in the collective variable space, uh, and that's the closest sample to those centers, which are uh, ensemble averages. And uh, this is something that you can, um, you can use if you are interested in uh, kind of um, using the data that you have generated before for some simulations and initiate new simulations. Uh, in other words, it's a method that can be used to uh, make the whole process of uh, free energy calculation and the string method, for instance, iterative. So you do free energy calculations. Uh, you see it's not a very good uh, uh, free energy calculation that doesn't pass some of your factors. You want to use the data and rerun uh, a string method with storms of trajectories. This post hoc string method allows you to initiate that. And then you can, after a string method, you redo the bias exchange umbrella sampling or any free energy calculation method that you want. And again, you, you check and you see some, something went wrong. So again, you use this method to initiate another set of simulations or so on. Or you can basically use it to combine multiple simulations that I showed in my example. Okay, so um, that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, any questions? At what threshold do you usually stop manually trying different collective variables and move towards a path of finding algorithm? Uh, when I have a transition that looks good, so it looks uh, like what I expect from the system, uh, I have an end state which is a stable and is similar to what I expect, intermediates don't look weird, and work is not very large. So I personally uh, am okay if the work is less than 100k cal per mole, just based on my experience. I don't have any mathematical proof why 100k cal per mole, but that's just my uh, kind of uh, gut feeling. Yeah? Is there a way after the fact to use a PMF as a, like a work bias and run like bias trajectories? Would that continually converge? Uh, use a PMF as, uh, yes, of course, yeah, you can always do that, yeah. Uh, so, uh, using PMF as a bias for, uh, I've actually uh, even have an automatic way of using the PMF uh, generated by uh, metadynamics uh, used for non-equilibrium pulling or SMD simulation. So it kind of iteratively does this until they converge together, which is published, uh, it's called driven metadynamics. Um, but then another uh, idea that I have used is when I have uh, done all of this for a system, and now I wanna do this for a similar system, like when there is a mutation uh, in the protein, instead of starting everything over, uh, I have actually used the exact same setting and the BIOS as well as the basically uh, to make this simple, starting from the non-equilibrium simulation. So in my non-equilibrium simulations, I have the BIOS there. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, I, I expect it still to have non-equilibrium work. That's the dissipative part, part, part of it, plus the uh, some free energy differences. And then from there, you can 
continue keeping that BIOS there in, in the rest of the simulations just to make things faster. Uh, and it has actually uh, uh, worked for um, simpler systems that I used before. Um, if you uh, look at my older papers, which are on peptides and things like that, it works very well. Actually, it makes things a lot faster for the, uh, you know, the, the, the second and third systems that you're doing this. For larger proteins, it hasn't been as successful as uh, I would say, because uh, maybe the, the part of the problem is the systems that I have studied are uh, too complex, and those mutations, for instance, are too uh, disturbing to the pathway. In this example that I just showed, you see that adding this phosphate completely changes the pathway. So the BIOS used based on the APO transition would do no good to my simulations because it's just not uh, relevant for the pathway relevant to the phosphate bound transition. Okay, any other questions? How big were your peptides for that? That it didn't work? Uh, those are proteins that it didn't work. So oh, okay. the peptides, yeah. yeah, it did work. Like, usually, how many rounds of this kind of analysis do you do? Like? Uh, well, I mean, it's completely dependent on the problem that you're interested in uh, and the collective variables that you are using. So. One of the ideas that uh, you should consider if something fails is adding collective variables into the equation. Like, for instance, if you don't see the dihedral angle being sampled correctly and it's discontinuous, you can add that in as a collective variable to make sure that it's sampled correctly. So uh, it all depends on how you treat your, the problem. If you're going to repeat this exactly the same way, it's not going to work. Uh, you, you should add the collective variables to the System and this is something that I have. Uh, if, if later you look at my my slides and I go back to the initial scheme that I have here, you'll see that um, some ideas are basically put in uh, in this scheme. Um, this one. So. Um, Probably, um, yeah, so it's, it's not in this scheme, but there is actually a, a paper that I have I talked more about this, um, this scheme, the, it's a JCPC paper 2014, uh, I should go back. Okay, so in this uh, JCPC paper, uh, I have some tips and tricks on how to fix problems when you fix them. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.